Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and together here with Celeste Gardner, we want to welcome you to uh, the Global Minded virtual event and also the higher education equity team led by Dr. Ryan Ross. Thanks to many of you who have joined us over the last few months. And uh, we are taking a pause for December for a couple of reasons. One, we have an event December the 2nd with the Foundations and Funders Equity Team, really all about how we can move money more equitably for COVID response, on the ground solutions, that type of thing. And also on December 9th, we have our Inclusive Leader Awards that we will be sharing with all of you in an edited version, thanks to Aussie Media, on December the 16th. So we're gonna be kind of focused on that, but we'll be back with Ryan and his guests in January. And um, we wish you an incredible holiday season, uh, even though we won't necessarily see you in December. So today's session is a continuation of the series of a Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. And today's segment is Out of Shadows, Voices, the Higher Ed and Political Experience for Veterans, Native Americans, and other underserved populations. We're delighted you could join us today, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Ross, who leads these sessions. Welcome, Ryan, and everyone on the team here today. Thank you, Carol. Um, as always, thank you to Global Minded for creating the platform and allowing uh, the space for these really great conversations. And thank you to everyone for tuning in during the holiday week. And if you're from Colorado, you tuned in while there was a mini blizzard this morning um, and you got through that. And so um, I hope everybody is well, being safe, making great decisions around the pandemic out there and uh, keeping not only yourself and your family safe, but everyone else safe. Um, again, I, I'm really excited to have our, our guest panel with us uh, today who will introduce themselves in just a second. Um, you know, as you know, Get Comfortable Being Uncomfortable uh, is a series where we're just keeping it real and having great conversations about the different kinds of things that are happening in higher education. And today we're gonna talk about um, veterans and um, our indigenous brothers and sisters and um, just their experiences in higher education and politics and society in, in general. And so this is one of those conversations that we could have for hours. Um, there are so many different nuances of this conversation, but the reality is, is we only have one. So we're gonna do the best we can to have a great conversation for you guys. Um, as always, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and if we have time to get to some questions, we will, but more than likely we'll be following up and responding to your questions via email um, after the event today. So with that being said, thank you again so much for being here. And I'm gonna go around and start having our panelists introduce themselves and then we're gonna jump right in. So we're gonna start with Leanne Wheeler. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Leanne Wheeler, daughter of Esther Mae Clements Wheeler and granddaughter of Rosa Esther Lewis Clements. And um, I wanna start off the conversation with, we are transpiring the entire dialogue on stolen land. Uh, I have the privilege of having served this country uh, in the United States Air Force. I'm a Desert Storm veteran. I moved on to about 22 years of defense contract work before starting my own business, uh, Wheeler Advisory Group, where I am the principal. And I spend a great deal of time now uh, education, uh, educating on legislation uh, and advocating for uh, legislation specifically for veterans and for other marginalized groups. Uh, it is my privilege to be with you this afternoon. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, Michael? My name is Michael Clement. I'm the uh, chair of the accounting department at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I've done a number of things before I came here. I, I spent some time working in public accounting, spent some time working in banking, I spent some time working in investment banking. So um, I'm happy to be part of this conversation today. I think the whole idea of getting comfortable being uncomfortable is a really important thing, right? We, we need to do a lot more of that. We're gonna make the kind of progress that we need to make. And um, diversity and inclusion is something I've really, uh, has been part of my heart for a long time. And actually it's, it's kind of generational. I have, I have an aunt that was actually a psychology professor at the University of Cincinnati who ran all kinds of special programs for under, underserved students. And uh, so it's kind of in my blood. I'm happy to be here today. Um, we're gonna to talk about things I really think are important. 
Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Cortez, and I serve as a director of STEM initiatives at Northeastern Illinois University. Through that work, I focus a lot in um, we fo well we focus a lot in equity, access, and inclusion. Um, I want to echo the words of uh, Ms. Wheeler about being having these conversations in stolen land. I think it is relevant to address it uh, to make sure that that's a point. Um, uh, on, 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 on the work that we do here at Northeastern University and tr TRIO programs, we focus on serving those most marginalized, right? Low income first gen. So we actually have services that are focused on veterans and natives. So we, we, we're we very excited to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Dr. Gladstone. Okay, nice to uh, Joe Gladstone. I nice to Kanikwan, Pukanikwan. Ki Nimipu, uh, Ki uh, United States Marine Corps Recon Man. Uh, hello, um, I am currently an assistant professor at the University of New Haven and uh, health sciences, primarily healthcare administration. My background is in uh, business administration, so my PhD. I had worked for uh, tribal uh, public health programs for a few years prior to going into academia. And I uh, also um, acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the Tiwa lands here in Southern New Mexico. Thank you. And I just wanna take a quick point of privilege to um, say that Dr. Clinton Portel couldn't be with us today. Um, and an excellent, excellent gentleman, but unfortunately uh, COVID-19 has affected his family directly. And so um, for however it is you, look out for people um, from a faith base, please send um, please send something up for Dr. Patel and his family, a prayer, a thought, um, just joy and light. Um, as many of you know, um, who, who may have been affected, it's, it's tough, it's challenging, and it's hard to go through. Um, and so we just, you know, we send love and light to Dr. Patel and um, he's with us in spirit and we'll hope to get him back at another time to um, share some of his expertise and just great wisdom with us all. So that being said, um, we are going to jump right in because we don't have a lot of time. And so panelists, um, let's talk about it, right? What do you feel like or how would you describe the experiences of, of Native Americans and veterans in higher education? So what's, you know, and, and more specifically, what's been working well? What needs attention? Kind of what are your knee jerk reactions? things that piss you off, the things that excite you. It's gonna throw it right on out there. Let's go ahead and get it going. Well, uh, speaking as a Native American, uh, primarily, um, a lot of the work is pretty much uh, related to my uh, professional work as an academic. And majority of my work actually looks at uh, indigenous knowledge in business education and organizational management. The uh, problem is, is that, you know, it's a very, very, very niche uh, uh, discipline. Um, in the United States, there's me and about uh, four or five other American Indian business professors who actually study this. And so it's basically working to get the indigenous voice out into the academy and seeing that you know, advocating for indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous knowledge, indigenous ontology and epistemologies being seen as equal, uh, equally valid ways of uh, understanding our world and business organizations. So that's been uh, pretty much all my scholarship most of the time ever since I was a doctoral student. And that's where I'm going uh, still today. And just, just as a quick follow-up, um, five, um, Native American professors studying your, your craft, your industry. Um, what's the plan for equity, right? Like, um, so you're, you're spending time doing the work, doing the research, but how are you um, making sure that again, your voice uh, from, as an academic is being heard across the academy and into to the business industry as a whole? Well, the five of us are in the United States. Um, actually, I'm doing my finger counts, maybe six of us, but anyways. This is just in the United States, but uh, the United States is rather behind the rest of the world as sadly we have been for the past four years. Um, and that uh, the, 
while there's only a small handful of us in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are, you know, moving leaps and bounds. And so I personally took it upon myself within the Academy of Management, which is my disciplinary academy, to create uh, the Indigenous Caucus within the Academy of Management. And I did that back in 2011. And there was about six people who showed up at the very first caucus. Uh, last count we had um, was around 80 people globally that are part of this caucus. And so primarily what we're doing is, you know, just basically the first challenge was just realizing that we're not the only ones out there. Um, what's created in the caucus and it brought a whole brought a whole bunch of other indigenous scholars to our Maori, Canadian First Nations, um, Aboriginal out of Australia, brought them all together and no longer in these little isolated pockets. And so there's a global network right now. Our biggest accomplishment though for the United States was one of uh, my colleagues, Dan Stewart, who is a Spokane Indian and out of Gonzaga University. Uh, we just uh, last week launched uh, IBAPA, the Indigenous Business and Public Administration Journal, and just launched our website last week. And so we're currently in the process of building up a cadre of uh, reviewers. And so and basically, well, we're being very proactive over the past years is basically getting our word out uh, that we exist and just pretty much being diligent uh, and persevering and letting others know that, you know, we're not a novel population, but, you know, we're a credible group out there. Thank you. Leanne, what are your thoughts? And so I'm actually a veteran who took advantage of um, what was at the time the Montgomery GI Bill. Uh, and it was, I believe, $10,800 uh, in assistance for education, which I have to put in the context of the 90s versus um, uh, what we're seeing now with um, the cost of education. Um, culturally, there is a difference actually for students who transition or would be students who transition from active duty military service back into community uh, as our training and education while on active duty looks quite a bit different uh, than it does uh, in private sector, uh, community college um, and um, um, secondary education. And what I have found to be helpful uh, is when a college or university has stood up a student veterans um, um, workshop or, or, or group so that these young uh, folks who are transitioning from active duty uh, can go into an education setting, still see and share time and space with folks who have a shared experience um, with, uh, with what active duty looked like. You know, when I transitioned from active duty after Desert Storm, um, I didn't have um, I didn't have that. I didn't have a student veteran body um, that could give me a warm transition, as it were, some a friendly face in a new space um, that functioned completely different, uh, completely differently than what what I was accustomed to. So it took me about two years um, to get adjusted, not only to now no longer being on active duty but now engaging a different system that had its structure, um, but it was a structure that I wasn't accustomed to. And so um, for many of our young men and women who go into the military, certainly education uh, is uh, in their minds in addition to um, patriotism and an interest in serving. But for many, this is their first job. Many are entering out of high school and don't have a higher uh, education level than um, those who don't go to academy, I should say, uh, don't have a higher level education than a high school diploma. And so because the training regimen and education regimen in active duty is so different, um, the skills or, or the things that need to be built up uh, in the individual student um, in some cases needs to be deconstructed uh, on, on the private education side and then um, re, uh, reconstituted. And having, having that, that um, student veteran uh, population there to kind of help uh, with that, I think makes all the difference between success and failure. And those who aren't familiar uh, with the GI Bill, um, it, it isn't, it isn't um, uh, 
just free money to go and, and good luck. It's if, if you don't make the, the grades, if you're not able to, to hold your own, it, it's a real possibility that you have to pay that money back. And so, um, which causes its own stress. Um, there's some financial uh, distress uh, in transition uh, that, um, that will often motivate an individual to go to college because there's a housing fund or um, there's, there's other stipends that are available to help them uh, in their transition. And so we need to take a look at that as well. Uh, so a, a number of the schools here in Colorado do have that, do have such a, um, a student um, veteran program. And I, and I believe the data shows that um, those who are engaged that way do better uh, on the other side um, of, of transition back into community and in their higher learning. Thank you. So so in, pre in preparation for this discussion, I decided I'd do a little bit of research on what we do by way of veterans because I'm not fully versed in that. And one of the things I found that surprised me a little bit, we have you know, student veteran services. And one of the things they do, um, it says, you know, I went to the webpage and it says they provide education and training for staff and faculty members to help them better understand the student veteran experience. So that seems like that would be a best practice. Um, the thing where I, I think the thing where I have a little bit of an issue with it, I'm not sure how well they publicize it because I don't, I don't think if I go onto the web page to try to figure out you know, what we're doing to help veterans, I don't think I would know about that. And, I, and I, I would imagine that most of my colleagues don't know about it, but it seems like a like a really good thing to do. And I think we probably should do a better job of publicizing it so we can do a better job of, of, of doing things like that. Speak, speaking of that, and, and Aaron, please jump in here. Sure. If it's hard for you as a faculty person, an esteemed individual on campus to have access to the information, um, <laughs> what's happening to the folks in the community who need the, the information? And, you know, and I say that kind of leading up to Aaron and the work that you guys are doing with TRIO, but even as you answer that question, you know, oftentimes, and, and I'm a TRIO guy myself, TRIO through and through, so shout out to all the TRIO programs that I see uh, chiming here in the chats. But in many, many states that I've been to to talk about TRIO or, or participate in things, one thing that's always been said is, you know, this is one of the greatest kept secrets in our state. You know, um, why is it such a secret? Why isn't the information getting out there? Aaron, what are you seeing um, in terms of experience for veterans and Native Americans on campus? Sure. So a, a, a few things. So first, you know, I'm, I'm not coming from the background of, of, of being a veteran. Um, I also don't have a background being Native American, right? But I, I do work on the field of serving, right? And, and, and supporting those populations. Um, and, and I think at, at the end, you know, one, one of the, the, the biggest challenges within higher ed is how do we communicate the type of services that we offer as an institution? And that happens in most institutions, right? And most institutions, uh, they might have a really good um, approach to communicating with, with students, yet, services such as like veteran services, even in my own institution, tend to be like hidden or dig in between like the levels of, of access within the web page, right? Let's just talk about the digital access, right? Um, so that's one. I think the other one is, is not only institutional, but within the states, right? Within the, the locations and the communities, right? Like the cities that we work with, the, the, the connectivity between the type of services that could be offered is, is, is not occurring. Right, so what do I mean by that? Um, it's the VA really having connections with all the VA, all the veteran uh, programs of services that will be offered at many institutions, right? Uh, do, do we have that? Do we have those connections? So I think sometimes when you're trying to address how do we support students? How do we, how do we make sure that we offer opportunity growth, especially in higher ed, is really making sure that our institutions are connected, right? And that they're working together, right? figuring out how the services could be better provided, better, better offer, and they're available, right? Um, and sometimes it just could be as simple as when you're applying, there could be a checkbox that, that checkbox within that digital application, right? Everything's digital now. That digital application that says, if you're a veteran, instead of just checking it off, it has a link that opens up and it informs of the services of the institution. That doesn't take much. That's not an additional layer of work. That is just dropping the link from the services website of the, of the, of the institution. So I think looking at it in veterans. Now for Native Americans, I think, you know, really addressing, um, and this comes from, from academia for research, right? Addressing really the, 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 the issues and the difficulties that the population has, right? In, man, in many of the reservations, right? Like all of the things that are 
um, environmental factors not allowing for Native Americans to be successful in, in, in higher ed, right? And so like looking at that and the institution being student centered and realizing that there's all these factors uh, beyond academics, right? Beyond academics. It's not about being good in math and reading. It's really about like, how do we support your health um, mindset, right? To, to be able to grow and to achieve. And you, do you have people that are gonna be supporting those individuals, right? So it's not about just like saying that you have the service, but who are we, the ones that we're serving? Are we reflecting those experiences? Are we able to talk from the same um, uh, uh, background, right? And not directly that background, like being Native American or being a veteran, but knowing that those struggles are happening within those individuals that end up being in those, in those, in those environments, those spaces. So I think it's really important to just look at those um, and, and figure out how do we ac actually make higher ed a little more accessible and, and not just accessible, but equitable. And when I said equitable, it's about, are we giving services to those most in need? Right. And so it's not just about graduation rates for the sake of graduation rates. It's really about how our graduates are doing an impact in society because education is about better making a better society. Correct. So I think that that would be my point on that one. Yeah. And, and just in follow up. And, and this is for anyone. Right. So we're, we're, we're talking about the student experience and. Um, you know, one of the things that we see for for uh, students of color and marginalized students, low-income students, first-generation students, veterans, um, Native American students, um, is you know seeing themselves on campus, seeing their culture on campus, being able to connect with um, someone, or being able to walk around an environment and feel like they actually belong there, and um, you know, I don't know that we always get that right in higher education. And so just curious as to your thought um, in terms of, you know, what should we be doing or, you know, what, what were your experiences um, either vicariously through students you've worked with or your own personal experience or, you know, students you just may have engaged with in the classroom or, 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 or um, fact, uh, colleagues that you've talked to about this kind of thing. You know, I can share um, firsthand having done some work with Arapahoe Community College. Um, and as they were standing up their student veteran um, services uh, center, uh, there, there were just, I think it was the point made earlier by Aaron that, you know, there, there's, there's a culture shock um, transitioning from active duty to academia. Um, there's a culture shock transitioning to academia, period. And, um, and so, um, what, what I have found in conversations with students um, at Arapahoe Community College, for instance, is that there are folks in um, class that are younger, you know, once they've done uh, their military um, term, they may be in their early 20s, but they're not 18. And, and so that first and second term of service also uh, exponentially matures them in ways as their first job, uh, these later era veterans um, in particular, is war. We've been at war as long as they've you know, more or less been alive. And, um, and then they served and now they're in academia. And, and so there were uh, um, facilitators, instructors, classmates um, that would ask things like, have you ever killed anybody? Um, um, do you have PTSD? You know, sort of these very insensitive um, questions and certainly more so out of ignorance, I'd like to think than, to, than being intentionally uh, hurtful, uh, but it, it affected the experience for those students. And so part of um, the uh, part of what has to happen, actually it was Michael that mentioned it, that getting with the, getting with the staff um, and training, um, providing that insight, uh, this, is not, this is not what you do. And um, it, it's not particularly helpful first. And then second, what do you do um, with those four, six or eight years where, um, where, where a, a veteran student may not be getting credit for a math course and has to take a remedial course over, say, uh, in community college, and they're in that class with an 18-year-old, they're 27. 
Uh, and so, so there's that, that age difference and cultural difference too in the space. And so maybe an 18 year old, you know, doesn't know not to ask that you kill anybody and laugh. Um, so, so how do we address that? And that is real, you know, th those are discussions um, that I've certainly have had. Um, then we've got veterans who are living unhoused, um, quite frankly, trying to go to school. It's a different experience that way as well. Um, so uh, to, your, to your question though, if, if we could create a culture where, um, where facilitators, staff, um, academia generally um, is getting some insight uh, into what the culture has been for a subset of their student base. I mean, that's sure money. I mean, let's keep it real. GI Bill money is sure money. Um, and uh, it might be a year or 18 months before we even determine that a student um, needs some help. Uh, they're not reaching out, they've turned up missing, but the government check keeps coming. Uh, and so, so maybe the connection between a counselor or a registrar's office and that student isn't forthright until the time that the VA says, show me the records. Um, and then somebody's gonna owe us that money back. So I think there's some work to do, um, just even having um, uh, this conversation recently uh, with students who are uh, currently enrolled. Thank you. Dr. Glaston, I, I would like to kind of shift this question to you, kind of speaking from both working in industry, but then also being a student, uh, making your way to, to attaining your PhD and just some of your experiences. Well, um, it's interesting listening to the conversations about the veterans because um, I went, you know, just like many has uh, been discussed earlier, is that I went into the Marine Corps straight out of high school. I had about a month between high school graduation and then uh, suddenly uh, having no hair and men in funny hats yelling at me for a few months. And so I had spent my uh, four years in the Corps and then uh, that's what inspired me to actually go to college. Um, and so I ended up, uh, it sounds like a lot of the programs that uh, I'm hearing about now weren't, they, at least at the University of Montana when I was uh, there, that not a lot of strong veteran programs that exist today. And so it was an interesting transition uh, going from a regimented military life to the more relaxed uh, uh, university life. And also being Native American, um, I'm a classic uh, first generation uh, for all my degrees. And so I'm the only one out of my immediate family who um, has a degree of any kind. And so there wasn't um, a lot of, uh, you know, past experience, any family mentoring or anything available. So it's a lot of uh, negotiating things, uh, you know, figuring things out on my own. Um, my Marine Corps experience definitely helped. I mean, it, you know, I was a 22 year old freshman and, you know, had some life experiences from the Corps prior. Um, the, but it was a lot of navigation. Uh, while there wasn't a, a strong uh, veterans program or none that I actually recall at uh, the university when I was in. Oh, additionally, I went in, uh, it was uh, shortly after the Vietnam era, but before the uh, Gulf War era. So back then there was no GI Bill. Um, my uh, education was funded through what was called the Veterans Education Assistance Program, which was a uh, two for one match. So during my time in the Corps, I would set aside $100 um, per pay period, and then that would be matched uh, twice, twice as much. And then I received that money during my um, undergraduate experience. Um, the Reagan administration, as I recall, did change the rules for Pell Grant eligibility, though, uh, being a veteran. Since there was no GI Bill, I, being a veteran, I was eligible for Pell Grant. And so that's what uh, supported me financially. The, uh, well, so while there's no formal veterans programs, there was a very strong Native American program. And that was uh, very interesting uh, for me. Uh, I went to University of Montana, which is my, uh, uh, the state that has my home reservation. I'm a Blackfeet Indian, which is up uh, by Glacier National Park in the Canadian border. And that's on my father's side. And then just over the hill from University of Montana is the Nez Perce Reservation, the Nez Perce community, which is my uh, mother's uh, home reservation. And so very strong native community at University of Montana and felt very much at home there. The very active uh, student group, student club. So we had a very strong network, very strong network of uh, native students. Um, I ended up becoming the president of the student club uh, during that time. 
after I graduated uh, with my undergraduate degree, I spent some time actually working as a national park ranger, uh, bounced around. It's, it's like to say I, I lived a uh, young man's adventurous life, you know, being in the military and then being a park ranger. I eventually ended up uh, going uh, back to the Seattle area where I was actually born and raised um, and ended up working for a tribe there in their health program uh, using my undergraduate degree. That work there, the leadership development skills I had both from the Marine Corps and um, from my time being the president of the Indian Club and also just uh, you know, management leadership uh, training I received as a public service um, employee helped me build a um, program at uh, Puyallup Tribe where I was at. And that work at, was, that inspired me to pursue my master's degree and I ended up going down to University of Arizona for that one. Um, I chose that school primarily because they offered a Master of Public Health and it did not rain. And so I was down there for that reason, but it was very fortunate because at the completion of that program, um, well, two things. Uh, it's one of these things where you're inside, you don't notice it, and you don't, it isn't until you're on the outside that you realize what benefit you had uh, from the experience. And University of Arizona, it turns out, they have a very strong public health program, especially in community health education, health promotion, and training me in that science. I supplemented that education with courses out of the management uh, college, um, Eller College. And so right out of getting out of that uh, uh, school, I was picked up by the Tana Atom Nation, which borders uh, Tucson, Arizona, which is University of Arizona and use, integrated my education and health, uh, health education science along with the management skills. And I guess just the personality that I was able to develop from my military experience, not so much the regimentation, but just you know, the confidence that the military gives you um, to build this program. Uh, it was a small diabetes program I built into a division of health promotion uh, using everything that all my education that I had. That work actually made me realize that uh, Indian country, a lot of the health problems we have in Indian country are symptoms of greater economic problems. When you look at the health science, uh, public health science journals, they talk about Indians having diabetes. Um, while they're poor, they have diabetes. And so let's do something about the diabetes. But then others would say they're poor, they have cancer. Let's do something about the cancer. They're poor, they have other social issues. Let's take care of the social issues. And so Again, I think it's just more personality than anything else is that I realized we should do something about that poor issue. And that's what inspired me to pursue my uh, business PhD, primarily looking at two things, the economic development side uh, that's needed for Indian country, but two, a uh, lot of development for management uh, development, management education uh, for Indian country for both the, their commercial enterprises and for their public administration activities. And so to us, my education just built off of experiences and seeing greater needs and greater needs. And uh, again, personality just decided to step forward and you know accomplish what I need to do in order to serve Indian country. Right, thank you. And so maybe it's time to get a little uncomfortable here. Let's, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so as of yesterday, we can officially say that there's a president elect maybe. Some of us have probably been saying it longer. Um, but, um, in Native American tribe, there was as much as I think an 89% turnout for Joe Biden, and then also a, a, a huge turnout, um, from veterans in support of, of Joe Biden as well. And, and I'm just curious from a business perspective, personal perspective, um, what does that mean? What, what, what's being said, um, based on the participation, especially the, the, the uptick in participation in the 2020 election cycle? So uh, there's another program I'm on periodically that where we read a trigger alert, but I'm gonna take uh, your preamble, Dr. Ross, as that trigger alert. Um, so there are five different eras of veteran yet living uh, in this country. And um, those of my, primarily my brothers, as we're, we're looking at World War II and Vietnam era veterans, um, would have voted for um, this president in 2016 uh, because they simply don't believe women ought to run the country or that women should serve as commander in chief. 
Um, what we've seen over the last four years has been a hot mess. And um, some of the uh, respect, quite frankly, and honor that we expect as veterans from our commander in chief was completely lacking. Uh, and then on the back end, uh, the downhill slide that is 2020, um, we were seeing an uptick in COVID diagnoses for uh, the same era of veteran uh, who voted for this president uh, in 2016, now changing their mind about that. We also um, are seeing younger veterans, more progressive, I, uh, and I'm air quoting that, um, veterans who have only ever had a career in the military and um, have been affected by some of the changes uh, that affect veterans uh, in our healthcare system, uh, in, um, uh, in a number of areas, but certainly now reintegrating into society or are finding themselves caught up in the same unfortunate circumstances as those who never served and wanting to make a decision, a different decision about that. Now, the conversation um, around um, uh, having someone who dodged a conflict uh, like Vietnam, not once, not twice, but several times. Um, and we're not talking about conscientious objectors per se, but folks who just didn't want to do their part uh, is now serving as commander in chief and running it all in the ditch. And so what doesn't get advertised a lot is sort of our internal um, discussions around this, uh, speaking of uncomfortable conversations where uh, folks I served with voted for, for this president um, in 16 and then doubled down uh, in, in 2020 um, without any uh, real consideration uh, for the character uh, and integrity, the fact that this man dodged the draft. Um, and, and, and so, the, so we're having those difficult conversations. But in the end, uh, groups like Common Defense, and I am uh, full disclosure an organizer with this organization, it's Progressive Veterans, um, and I'll drop the uh, email in the chat, um, who have been actively engaged in these candidate races. Uh, to flip these seats. Now, I come to the conversation as an unaffiliated voter, which translates to independent um, in, in other states. And uh, so, and we represent uh, about a third of Colorado uh, as far as registered voter, voter registration goes, um, a smaller sliver as far as the veteran group uh, goes. Generally, veterans are more conservative or registered Republicans. And we'll, and we'll vote the Republican ticket based on that service. Uh, and so we're starting to see a shift, at least here in Colorado, uh, around um, uh, not only veterans transitioning back to community, but owning, I'm back, and some of the things that are affecting my neighbors also affect me. Um, and what we've managed to do in this country uh, previous to this, to this era is, is do some set aside stuff for vets, like held this out as special. Um, and so we, we will do this for our vets and, and because we wanna honor their service in this way. Um, and that was driven through policy. Um, and uh, what we now have is a commander in chief who would call us losers and suckers. So we weren't as sure, right, that we, we were gonna get um, the, the programs or the commitments to our service. When we took our oath, we were, we were told as a result of the oath, there were certain things that were gonna happen uh, on the other side of you being issued your DD-214. Now, all of a sudden, we're not so confident that, that this was um, a, a commander in chief that would tend to the, to the basic human needs and the transition needs um, of the veteran population. And in that case, in that real dialogue, um, some of those folks moved off of the Republican ticket for Republican ticket's sake and, and voted um, uh, more anti-Trump than pro-Biden. And so we, 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 we also need to have that conversation. And I fell into that camp. I, 
you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to, to some restorative uh, policies and, and not having to worry that I've got a commander in chief that's going to go scorched earth or that we've got a commander in chief that would not address Russian bounties on our service members' heads while they're in theater. Um, all of this is going on right now. And so I welcome that coming to a halt. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, we were, um, and those that I've worked with locally, um, were more anti-Trump than pro-Biden. I'm getting, I'm getting to be excited about him, but that's not where I started. Thank you. Let's go, let's go to Michael and then to Aaron. Well, it looks like you're, you looks like you're on mute. I think there, I think a lot of us were, uh, probably more anti-Trump than we are pro-Biden. But, but I agree with you, Leanne. I think we are becoming, a lot of us are you know, feeling more comfortable about him right now. Um, I think what happened in some cases, maybe more so with Native Americans is, you know, the president was so divisive that you're kind of either in the in-group or the out-group. And I think if you feel like you're in the out-group, you're way, mis way less likely to vote for him. And I think, I think that's what happened. I think that's a big part of what happened. I think a lot of us felt like we were in the out group. And so, you know, we just were not so comfortable um, voting for him. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's a big part of what happened. That's yeah. a big part of what happened. So Aaron, and then also Aaron, if you would address, uh, cause we've got a lot of trio folks on the line, it looks okay. like um, to the extent that you can speak to it, the funding challenges, um, you know, trio right. looking at being zeroed out and, and, and some of those things. Well, definitely. I, 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 th I think I could um, offer s some content there um, in, in my participation in the CEO uh, community um, and COE community and TRIO overall. Um, but I mean, I think everything that has been said, um, it, it just hits it on, on the nail, right? I think um, many people were just not really excited about a Biden ticket, right? Um, and I think when Kamala came aboard, and I think that shifted a little bit. I mean, a, a lot of people kind of like figure, okay, this is, it, it might be a little bit different than the expectation, right? Um, also, you know, yes, I, I, I also full disclosure, I do both um, Democrat, but I do make decisions on candidates. So like, there's a lot of times where I might have, a, I, there might be a, another party candidate um, that it's not aligning with, 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 with you know, what I have voted in the past and we just go in that direction because it's the best for the people right because they're supposed to serve the people right so um, I think um, a, a little bit side before I, I go into the funding um, I think you know going back to the divisiveness right I think going back to you know um, really marking the differences between one group and another group right I, th I think the, having a White House that what the uh, government that was promoting and, and ensuring the ability of individuals to feel like they could um, once again marginalize to an extent that it's very vocal, right? You know, we, I gotta be very honest. Racism has always been there. Marginalization of people have always been there. It's just, it, it was put aside, hidden in a, inside of somewhere that didn't get a lot of light unless you were in there, then that's how you knew. Um, but, you know, for the majority of the people, you didn't see it because it wasn't talked about. And so this past couple of years has been like, hey, yes, we've been around for quite some time. Right. And so like we were just waiting around to see how how we're given voice. And I think, you know, that that being given voice to that specific group allowed many of us to feel unsecure. Right. I, I, how am I as a, as a black man could walk around? right, a neighborhood and not feel threatened if, you know, the police come, right? Or how am I, uh, you know, if a pipe is being put through and not that this is just one issue here, right? It comes from other uh, other administrations, but if there's some like gas pipes coming through my neighborhood, my summer street, right? And I can't do anything because they're gonna kick me out because the police could come, because the FBI could come, because the military could, I mean, the, the use of force against, you know, many minority groups has been, you know, a little bit more than we are used to, right? And so I think, you know, not that we should be used to things like that, but, you know, it, it, it was much more um, allowed in some ways, right? It, it, many of us turned the blind eye, right? But the reality is that this just, this, this went to an exponential level, right? And so I think, I think that divisiveness, that, that really talking of hate, right? 
um, I think that kind of like brought a lot of individuals to kind of move, you know, so yeah, definitely like uh, uh, Ms. Willer was saying, right? Like if you are like, no, I, I don't know if you are going to abide to this or not, right? Like you're making decisions that benefit a specific group and that doesn't include the rest of us. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that, that is very interesting. I think in terms of the funding, you know, we, we, as soon as, uh, uh, as this um, last four years, as soon as that, that new transition happened, right. With uh, president Trump uh, with 45, right. Um, I, you, many of us in, in, in any kind of educational program, we're very afraid that there will not be an educational department, right. Like the department of education will be gone. Right. That was like in the mindset of, you know, many individuals, right. Many people that were making policies out of their own personal desires, right. Not policies that were inclusive or that were supported with their vetted. There were just policies that were made to like impact people and to cut, right. And to cut funding. So I think, you know, a, a, a trio programs and many other programs that are federal funded have, you know, organizations that are supporting them so they could be funded by partition, right? Like it doesn't matter if you are a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian, it does not matter, right? Independent, right? Does not matter. What we're working on is funding the services that are ne necessary for those that do not have the help, right? So I think in that sense, it, it has been a battle and it, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democratic president, you know, funding in the Department of Ed, it's always a battle, right? It's always about advocating and advocating and advocating because low income and first generation, um, different able veterans, you know, they're not having that voice, right? They're not given the voice. So, so if you are building, if you have the opportunity to be in those spaces, you have to speak on their behalf and support them and do whatever you can, because, you know, at the end of it all, a better society for all of us work, right? So I think, you know, just looking at it that way in terms of, like, of those fundings um, and, and how they impact this, you know, once again, now, now, um, with, with uh, the Biden campaign and with the new president-elect, right? I mean, we know that we're probably gonna get someone in the Department of Education that has some interest that probably reflects, you know, a very large percentage of the population, not white percentage of the population, right? So maybe those are some things that we're also looking forward, but we're holding our feet to the fire, right? It's not gonna be like, okay, that happened, it's gone. It's okay, no, we still have demands. We still have things that are gonna help our, in the, our, our people and the people that we serve, so. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Glassman. So, yeah, to serve my student full disclosure, um, the very first president I voted for was uh, Jimmy Carter's re-election and I didn't win. And so I've, uh, I come from a family that uh, I believe I don't vote against my own interests. And so um, I'm very left leaning in all my uh, political orientations. Um, I would say I probably, and sometimes I felt when I was in the Marine Corps, I was probably the only guy who actually uh, was very as left leaning as I was and still remain today. The uh, one thing I'm listening to the conversations, you know, like a lot of the, uh, I'm looking at the panelists, you know, I, I look at the students, you know, from that professor view, the students, when I see them, they're in my classes. And so I, you know, they're there to learn something. Uh, since I've been teaching public health, the majority you know, of students in public health are very left-leaning people. It's a, it's a very liberal profession. And so the, even the veteran students that I get uh, tend to already have that political orientation that I subscribe to. It's not, I don't think I've ever really ever met any very uh, overly strong um, right-leaning uh, students in the, in the discipline. So, you know, looking at, you know, just from my own perspective, in terms of looking at, you know, the Trump Biden issues, you know, I, I always, I don't, I never had that, you know, I, I'll, I'm, you know, as what's talked in uh, economic terms as satisfaction um, or satisfaction, you know, it's just trying to get that best, sati you know, being satisfied at that level. Um, I came in with uh, preconceived biases already since I've always voted. Uh, left my entire life. Um, and then the students that I have, you know, being public health students are already left leaning orientations. So I can't really say, you know, from my perspective, anything on the contrary. It's that uh, the profession is, 
exist to serve the community and people who serve the community want resources that generally are inspired from the left side. Most, you know, the American, the Affordable Care Act uh, was under threat for many years from the day it was signed simply because it was, you know, a, it was a liberal uh, viewed, you know, it was viewed as a liberal act and it was signed by Obama. And so it did not deserve to exist. And our, all the arguments, even the one that just uh, was uh, debated in the Supreme Court all had to do, do with this mandate to have insurance without anybody really looking at the act at all 900 pages of it. And I admit, I haven't looked at all 900 pages, but I do know the sections and to toss out, you know, laws that benefit people who need health care, uh, you know, uh, of different incomes, different accessibilities, disabilities, Native American uh, Health Care Act is actually uh, made permanent because of that law. Everything that benefits health care and healthcare professions, public health advocacy exists in that. And to have it tossed out just because somebody doesn't want to buy insurance isn't, that isn't good thinking. I mean, it's just, it's, it's basically done to spite people to make one, you know, uh, just because one party didn't like a president to toss out the baby with the bathwater, as they say. And so, you know, just that's, you know, to be things uncomfortable, that's kind of where, you know, I, I am totally uh, uh, quite open in my uh, liberal uh, thoughts in terms of, you know, protecting society. Michael, I, I wanted to come come to you and and and, and shift this a little bit to business, um, and and then definitely want to hear from the rest of you as you all have experience um, as entrepreneurs, business working with students who are going into business, things of that nature. What opportunities are you seeing for veterans, um, Native Americans, uh, in the business world, and, and what you know what does that look like? Um, are there challenges? Um, are there things we need to be thinking about? Or is it things, you know, for the folks on the on, 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 on the call with us, on the Zoom with us, who are working with students directly, are there things that they need to be thinking about for business opportunity for these students? Um, can you talk, just talk to that some for us? I have a pretty simple philosophy of education. I think it's all about developing critical thinking and communication skills to begin with. Because I, I believe if you have those skills, you will always be able to find a job. Because I, <laughs> what I say is maybe three quarters of the people walking around may not have those skills. And so you always stand out if you have those skills. But I think you need to put something on top of that, right? Some kind of specialty, some kind of either technical skills or whatever. Um, in our field, I'm, I'm an accounting professor. You know, we see we see things moving in a more like data-driven kind of a world, right? So we're thinking, you know, these, in our in our in our world, we're thinking like understanding, you know, data and how to analyze data, think about data, uh, digital tools and things like that are are really important. Um, but whenever I think about anything like that, I'm always thinking. I think if you can. You know, I, I, tell, I have two sons, I tell them, if you, if you have critical thinking skills, if you can think good thoughts, worthy thoughts, and if you can express them well, I think you're always gonna be okay. And you'll be able to figure out what's going on. You'll, you'll, you'll get to a good answer if you have those skills. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's my basic way of thinking about things. The, the other thing I wanted to say is just from an educator standpoint, you know, listening to the conversation, I, I really think that, uh, I think inclusion is so important in academia. I think if, if everybody doesn't have a chance to speak and if we can't hear what they have to say, I think we're losing out and we're not getting the best education that we can. And, and so I think that, I think listening to this conversation today makes me realize that we have to really kind of think about what do we mean when we say inclusion? Because sometimes I think we, we may um, define it too narrowly, right? And I think, I think those of us who care about inclusion, I think you know, we need to think about it also. There's some people who are never gonna really think inclusion is important and we have to try to figure out how we can bring them into the tent, okay? And I'm, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we help them understand how important diversity and inclusion is. I think they're both important, but I think, uh, I think we need to kind of think about, I do, I think we need to think a little bit more about what do we mean when we say inclusion because it's not, it may not strictly be, you know, if you're black or Latino, and it might not be that, it might not just be if you're male or female, it, might, it, should, it should consider some other dimensions of who we are, right? I think for those of, who, those of us who care about diversity and inclusion, I think we you know, probably need to talk with each other to make sure that we can, can broaden each other's concepts of what that is so that we can, we can do a better job in the classroom. Because I think we're gonna have a better educational experience and a better society when everybody feels like they, have, like they, like they belong, like they, like they can participate, people care what they have to say. So 
I think that's something else that as we're preparing people to go into the world, I think we need to help them develop those skills. <laughs> And one other thing I'm going to say about going forward, just a little bit off, not exactly what you asked, Ryan, but one, one of the places where what I believe is not necessarily um, received as well by my colleagues as some other things I have to say is, you know, while I believe in diversity and inclusion, I think we also have to prepare our students to know that when they go into the world, it's not going to be perfect. And so you have to, I think we have to provide some coping skills also. So when you get out there and everybody's not hugging you, I always say if we if we if we create the perfect environment, you know, inside the academic institution, as soon as they leave, it's not gonna be perfect anymore. And if you don't know how to deal with that, you're gonna be behind, right? So I think we want to create as, as good of an of an institution as we can, but we also have to prepare our students and equip, equip them with skills. So when they leave here, you know, they can deal with the world we're gonna find it, right? So I don't want to make a political statement, but when you have like 70 million people voting for a certain kind of ideology that may not may not be consistent with you know diversity and inclusion you kind of have to be prepared to deal with that when you leave right you have to prepare for it so so those are just some of my thoughts not not all directly related related to what you asked but there's some things like i kind of, I kind of wanted to get on the table while why you, you were kind enough to give me the mic <laughs> no no thank you and you know and and again like i said just a uh, a few short 56 minutes ago this hour would Zoom by, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, but um, but we're we're almost at um, our time, and so what I wanted to do was, it's 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 just this right picture on uh, college campuses across America right now. Um, well, probably on college computers across America right now, because people are uh, more than likely um, taking classes from home. But there there are veterans, both young and old, there are uh, Native American students who are engaging in the higher education process. And um, as the title of this conversation alludes to, they don't have a voice or they're voiceless or they're not being heard. Um, with that in mind, what advice, um, as a final thought, what, what piece of advice would you give to those students and those folks who work with them on a daily basis to ensure that um, we change that, that they have a voice, that we are hearing them and that um, we're looking at policy and experiences that ensure um, we get to a place where all students, especially these students, have the ability to thrive. Since I just spoke for a while, I'm just going to put one quick thing on the table, let somebody else have a chance to say something. One of the things that we've done here that I'm hoping will have some progress is we have to, as faculty members, we have to fill out an annual report every year saying what we did that particular year in general, like research, teaching. And so our senior associate dean said, you, you need to have a statement in your annual report indicating what you did to promote diversity and inclusion in your classroom. Okay, so I think the whole idea of trying to find somebody to hold people accountable on some level, knowing that somebody is going to be looking at what you're doing and, and somebody's asking you about what you did. Um, and so and, and the other thing is, you know, so then we try to share best practices. People talk about what they did. We try to share best practices. One, one example, just one quick example, uh, when we have group projects, the faculty member assigns the group, right? Because we find that if we let the, if we let the, the students assign the group, there's some students who are gonna get left out because they don't look like everybody else, right? So if we assign a group, we can make sure that doesn't happen, okay? And so we we, we, we share ideas like that, you know, from, from these statements that we prepare. Here's here are the three things I did to promote diversity and inclusion in my classroom. So I think those are some of the things that we can do, but I think accountability, however we're gonna get where we're trying to go, accountability is gonna have to be part of it because I think a lot of people just aren't gonna do it unless they feel like they're somehow being held to account for what they're doing. <clears throat> Thank you. 30 seconds, Dr. Glastone. I, best way I can, uh, you know, just allow, speaking from professor view, you know, let the students uh, share their voices, um, their perspectives, their opinions, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, classroom moderate, you know, modulation or management there that, you know, everybody's voice is valid and equal. And for me, it's primarily sharing my own academic views and my opinions as a Native American professor. Students in my classes know that I'm Indian and I don't hide that. Thank you. Aaron. Oh, in 30 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I think perhaps it, it really are, are we as higher ed prepared to serve the students that are coming to us? Like, are we the ones prepared rather than like saying, are students coming with the right skill set? to fit our model of higher ed, right? And so I think that's transitional. I think that's also like has to do with one of the questions of, you know, um, 
integrating inclusion, right? And so like search, search and screen committees, are you involved with those? Are you putting your the word in there to say, no, we need to be diverse. We need to reflect our students. And even if we don't reflect our students, we need to deflect, reflect some type of diversity that includes other people very different than ourselves, right? So hopefully that, that helps. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, and actually I'll piggyback on what Aaron said. There's a certain insinuation that we have to make um, as uh, non-white professionals in all of these spaces. And so I have an opportunity um, to serve on service academies, for instance, and um, I am uh, intentional about seeking out candidates to apply who look like me because I did not serve with another black woman the entire time I was in service um, outside of my training. Uh, and so, yeah, I would, I would absolutely piggyback on what Aaron's saying. Is the culture, is the culture ready? Uh, and certainly having those supports in place uh, uh, goes a long way uh, in making that pivot um, from the institutional piece to uh, an accommodating space uh, for, for students. Thank you. And so I want to say we are at our time. I want to say thank you to, to all of you for sharing your time, talent, expertise um, with myself and Global Minded and all of the folks on this call. Um, to the folks who are listening, I want to say, you know, um, let's, let's, let's have a conversation about assimilation, right? Like the more we ask people to assimilate, the, that, that's, an, a, that's an attack on individuality. It's an attack on culture, right? And so we can't ask people to start assimilating into, into environments because that's the environment and that's the way we've always done things. You know, it's time, it's time to do things different. It's time to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And so again, thank you to the panelists who sat in the hot seat with us and got uncomfortable and was real and share great insight. We really appreciate you. And, and as always, uh, thank you to Global Minded for the platform. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Carol Carter. Thank you so much, Ryan, and to all of you who made time to attend today and all of the different panelists and their really uh, incredibly interesting perspectives. And the one thing that, that we will ask is we, we recorded the session and tomorrow for anybody who signed up, we'll have the link. And if you all can share the link with at least 10 people, and I would really ask that they be students because students often don't see these incredible role models in some of the faculty that they have for most of their classes. And um, we have a lot of these equity sessions with other, you know, we have a tech session coming up on um, the 30th is our next one. Very diverse tech leaders in a field that's not very diverse. Uh, so we really want to get students involved. We had our very first student lead a panel um, last week on funding for students who are entrepreneurs. His name's David Lopez. And uh, we had funders and we had them talking about how the money can move more for people of color and um, you know, women and the people who are typically not funded. So I think um, in the future, we'll get more students involved, but we really realize you all are the role models for them. We weren't able to be in person this year at our big event, but traveling your wisdom through all your different channels is how we can really make a difference. And um, finally, I'll say that um, I mentioned it in the beginning, but we have our Inclusive Leader Awards on the 9th. And on the 16th, we'll be widely sharing that with everybody who's ever attended an event with Global Minded or who signed up for a webinar so that you can share some of the most inspiring role models as we end this really hard year of 2020. So thanks again to all of you from the Global Minded community. And we so appreciate the way in which you are hel helping us develop a, a creative, capable talent pipeline and looking forward to working with you all in the future in a number of different ways. And um, have an incredibly blessed Thanksgiving and um, holiday season. And we'll be in touch with you and Dr. Ryan's session again in January. So keep, keep uh, your eyes peeled on the newsletter for those updates. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks all. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank